Dear Mr. Donfritz, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear young leaders, I'm really delighted to be here and uh, to be addressing you at this event organized by the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy by, by the, for the, uh, the, the ICD. I'm grateful to Mr. Mark Donfried for asking me to speak to you in my role as chair of the German-British Parliamentary Friendship Group in the German Bundestag. I really uh, appreciate uh, that uh, so many young leaders, especially from the UK, uh, spent uh, this week here in uh, Berlin, and I, have you have, I, th I hope you have a marvelous time here. Unfortunately, the weather isn't so good as uh, it was um, uh, in the south in the last days. Uh, so, um, but you, uh, and in the end, you can concentrate more on the work and on the seminar. I would like to begin with a general assessment uh, of uh, how I see the work involved in promoting German-British relations. After a look at the structure of the work of the Parliamentary Friendship Group, I will make some comments on the topic of this year's conference. I will be happy to take your questions at the end of my presentation. I've been a member of the German Bundestag since 2002, as Mr. Donfried already mentioned, and uh, I'm a directly elected member for the constituency of Altötting and Mülldorf. It's in the southeast of Bavaria. It's not so famous. Altötting is a, a quite um, popular uh, pilgrim uh, town. It's the most popular Catholic pilgrim town uh, in the German-spoken um, world. And uh, it's also the constituency where the actual pope uh, is born. Um, as a spokesman on internal affairs and legal policy for the Bundestag group of the CSU parliamentarians, I spent much of my time working on a wide range of social and legal policy issues. I've been chair of the German-British Parliamentary Friendship Group since the spring of 2009. I'm a successor of the former minister to Gutenberg. He was uh, uh, the chair of the German Friendship, uh, British uh, Parliamentary Friendship Group and uh, left this uh, function when he became minister. This is a field of uh, work that I find particularly interesting due to my great personal interest in the United Kingdom. First, I want to speak about the aims of the German British uh, institutions, the mission of organizations that are actively devoted to German British relations is clear. The close and trusting relationship between these two great European nations must be maintained and in some areas strengthened even further. And I'm very pleased to stress that, my, that many stakeholders have set themselves this objective. The Königs Winter Conference, at which I have been a guest for many years, is one such example. It deserves special recognition for its work on promoting and helping to shape German-British dialogue on many different levels. Allow me to say a few words on the Königswinter Conference. The first Königswinter Conference took place in Königswinter am Rhein, just one year after the German-English Society was founded in 1950. The conference aimed to provide a solid framework for the great work being done to improve relations between Germany and the United Kingdom. The result was a forum where participants could share opinions in a private and free setting. There was not much press coverage of the conference discussions or the participants who have included German Federal President Richard von Weizsäcker, for instance, or Lord Dahrendorf, the British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, or Marion Gräfin Dönhoff, and many more. This is what has always made and continues to make the Königs Winter Conference so special. Every year it offers representatives from business, government, parl parl uh, parliaments and society the opportunity to come together in a pleasant setting and share experience, maintain relationships and even build friendships. I have had the pleasure to uh, participate in this conference on several occasions. I look back on each of them with great pleasure and still treasure the acquaintances I made there. These kinds of traditions are most definitely very special driving forces behind friendships and close relationships. But social and public initiatives are just as essential to our cause as trusting dialogue is. What other promising approaches exist that will allow us to develop our partnership and to face national and international challenges together 
confidentially and with the, necessar with the necessary equanimity. In my opinion, the most important aspects are mutual curiosity and language. It is wonderful to see you all here today. It shows that you are interested in these issues and in gaining an insight into German culture and society. It is an impressive confirmation of the eagerness that still exists in Germany and the United Kingdom, particularly among young adults, to learn about the other country. For us Germans, it is and always has been slightly easier in terms of language. A German who speaks English gains access to a large number of countries and regions. This means that particularly every school in Germany teaches its pupils English from the year five onwards. A school trip to the United Kingdom is now a standard part of the curriculum at almost all German secondary schools. In the United Kingdom, on the other hand, German is a foreign language, unfortunately, uh, as a foreign language, unfortunately, plays as much uh, a much less significant role in schools. While in the last few years, around uh, 11% of British school children learned German, over 90% of their peers in Germany learned at least basic English. I believe that we should continually develop initiatives and concepts to make learning the German language more appealing. And uh, I was informed by the German ambassador, Mr. Baumgarten, in, in London, that uh, in, the, in the last um, month he was very successful in promoting German more uh, about um, the um, British television, BBC, pro um, broadcasted uh, a series of, um, um, of um, uh, reports about uh, Germany and also in uh, British uh, newspapers uh, the topic of learning German was stressed uh, even more. So I think there are good hints uh, of uh, promoting German, the, language, the German language more in the UK. In the two years since I became particularly involved with British-German issues, I have met many teachers who have built up or who plan to build up connections to the United Kingdom on their own initiative. We have always worked closely with the British Embassy in Berlin to support such efforts. The organization UK-German Connection, for example, has always been a helpful port of call in setting up exchange programs for schools and young people and in establishing long-term partnerships. And of course, the British Council, the UK's largest organization for international exchange, plays a very important role in this regard. As you can see, my work on German-British issues continually brings me to contact with people and institutions that are deeply committed to maintaining and developing bilateral relations in a most impressive way. And this is of course, and this of course includes the organizer of this conference, the ICD. Now I would like to speak about the tasks of the German-British Parliamentary Friendship Group. There are more than 50 different parliamentary friendship groups in the German Bundestag. And all the parliamentary friendship groups of the German Bundestag are designed to maintain and expand bilateral contacts to other national parliaments. We have uh, more than 40 members, so we are one of the largest um, parliamentary friendship groups in the German Bundestag. Uh, the largest one, of, uh, for example, is the USA uh, parliamentary group, and the uh, second largest one is the one uh, which deals with uh, Israel. The aim to do so by developing an ongoing dialogue with the parliaments of the other country. They, to, to, to this end, the friendship groups address relevant issues and try to meet as often as possible with parliamentarians and other representatives of the partner countries to share information, opinions and experiences. Many partner countries also have corresponding parliamentary groups for Germany that pursue the same aim for their own country. The United Kingdom has one such group, the all-party uh, all British-German parliamentary group, headed by the member of the parliament, uh, Paul Farrelly. Mr. Farrelly and I discuss current issues on a very regular basis. The German-British parliamentary friendship group convenes regularly to discuss current topics that are usually a focus of intense debate in both countries. Heading the agenda of these meetings in the last few months were, of course, 
the major changes in the United Kingdom following the 2010 elections, ways of dealing with the financial crisis, the consequences of the nuclear catastrophe in Japan, the current uprisings in the different uh, North African countries, and the British government's very ambitious austerity program. The members of the German-British Parliamentary Friendship Group also meet regularly with the British um, ambassador here in Berlin. The meetings discuss, among other things, what initiatives we can start or continue. I kept in close contact and held numerous discussions with Sir Michael Arthur, the British ambassador, until October of of the last year. His successor, Mr. Simon MacDonald, has only been in office for a few months, but already a trusting relationship in uh, developing is developing between us, and he also was a guest, and he already was a guest in our uh, parliamentary uh, group. Delegations of members of the parliamentary friendship groups usually visit the partner country once in every electoral term to strengthen our contacts in person. Current plans are for a delegation of British parliamentarians under the leadership of Paul Farrelly to come to Berlin at the end of June of this year. During these visits, we try to organize a series of a, 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 a series of meetings to cover as many areas of conceivable cooperation as possible. These discussions are equally concerned with problems and possible solutions regarding home affairs, migration policy, with uh, economic policy measures, and with exchanging information on developing um, policy and cultural initiatives. But I don't want to bore you by getting too bogged down in details on the structures of these political institutions. So I would like to move on and address the topic of this year's conference as I see it. The United Kingdom and Germany in a changing world order, new challenges, new strategies. These days, it is still a common place to talk about a new world order, even though over two decades have passed since the end of the Cold War War, and the critical developments it brought about. But these developments continue to significantly define the structure of the international system and the behavior of international political players. In the last 20 years, we have witnessed this fundamental shift in global structures. While the Cold Cold War was mainly waked through showers of power and proxy wars, the world has since become much more complex. The analyses carried out shortly after the fall of the Iron Curtain were based on assumptions that conditions would be much clearer. In 1992, the political scientist Francis Fukuyama predicted, in quota, the end of history, end of the quota, meaning that the that the future would be free from the Syria from from serious threats we had experienced up to the end of the Cold War. It soon became clear, however, that the collapse of the global balance of power went hand in hand with a considerable degree of uncertainties. When the British politician Douglas Hurd spoke in 1993 of in quota the new world disorder end of the quota, he painted a rather accurated, uh, accurate um, picture of the asymmetrical structure we are now seeing on a global level. Today's global political agenda is increasingly defined by issues such, such as failing states and international terrorism. It has become even more apparent that the fear of the mutual destruction of East and West with all its terrible implications, ultimately created a very stable balance. This balance no longer exists, and we must now find answers to many new questions. Now, though, the crucial analytical conclusions have been made, putting some facts beyond dispute. For example, no single country is currently in a position to solve today's complex problems on their own. In many, in my opinion, this makes it all the more important to use the full weight of Europe in matters of foreign security, defense, and development policy. Europe is a union of 27 states and 550 million inhabitants, who together generate one quarter of global growth uh, national product. This means that Europe must take on its role as a global player and assume responsibility for a global security and global development. 
I believe that it is essential for Europe's leading countries to agree on joint aims, initiatives and measures. This means that they must engage in ongoing dialogue at a political level, yet another reason why a close relationship between the United Kingdom and Germany is of extreme importance. Of course, the UK's position on many European issues is colored by a certain skepticism. This includes the UK's specific uh, perspective on the monetary union and its continuing interest in retaining as much freedom as possible, especially regarding defense policy. Forcing British foreign and security policy into a too tight framework would not reflect this. It is the country's independence and self-confidence that allows it to take such effective and targeted action in key issues. An example that springs to mind here is the system that the United Kingdom has introduced for recording and transmitting passenger information. It's called PNR, Passenger Name Records. While Europe will probably spend years debating on an uh, appropriate form for its own version, the British system has been in daily use for a long time now. The clear Euroscepticism in some political fields in the United Kingdom becomes much less relevant when common aims and pathways are defined and implemented, particularly when the achievements of joint European action become immediately and even more obviously visible. Another current example of the great need for European and international cooperation and agreement is the future of nuclear power. In view of the horrifying events in Japan, in Fukushima, I also mentioned it, I already mentioned it, I believe Europe needs to reach as broad a consensus as possible on how to counter the risks associated with this technology. It is beyond dispute that radioactive threats do not stop at national borders, especially in a relatively small area such as Europe. I therefore welcome the European initiative to find a joint position for the future of our energy supply. And so I'm very thankful for the German Commissioner, Mr. Oettinger, who is responsible for the energy policy in the European Commission. However, I also know that Up until recently, the UK, you, the UK was planning to make huge investments in the expansion of nuclear power. This will, of course, not make it easier to agree on a common European position. But I think uh, it's one of the most uh, crucial discussions now going on in Europe, and uh, probably uh, you um, are informed about that the 80% of the German population are against uh, the use of uh, nuclear power anymore. And uh, I have the um, assumption that in, in the United Kingdom, the amount uh, of um, uh, persons who are against nuclear power is rising. And so I'm very uh, interested, uh, interested also in your views uh, touching this, this topic. On the other hand, trade and investment flows, technological progress and the spread of democracy have brought freedom and prosperity to many people. I believe that this development is one of the great political achievements of recent decades. But on the other hand, we are also facing a whole host of challenges, some of which are truly immense. The current focus on, of attention in security And European policy is, alongside efforts to establish a functioning safety net of for the euro, the situation in North Africa in general and in Libya in particular. As much as we welcome and support authoritarian states and social uh, systems moving towards freedom, democracy and the rule of law, these events also present challenges for the European countries. Coordinating military operations and humanitarian aid and working out how to deal with large numbers of refugees are certainly two of the most pressing issues of these days and weeks. The events and the uprisings in North Africa clearly show how conflicts that start off at local and regional levels can very quickly escalate and affect the majority of global stakeholders. Concerning the current situation in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, region, 
I agree with the view that small countries such as Malta need our support. Germany has therefore agreed to take in some refugees, especially from Malta, 200 until now. If other European countries follow Germans, uh, Germany's example, it will soon help to ease the situation in Malta. But looking at Italy, we can see that the situation is quite different. In the last few weeks, pictures of refugees from North Africa arriving by boat to the Italian island of Lampedusa, not far from Tunisia and Libya, have regularly featured in the German news. But in the overwhelmingly majority of cases, these are not persons who have been prosecuted and uh, therefore have a legitimate claim to asylum. There are economic refugees, that is, people who want to emigrate to Europe on account of the difficult economic situation in North Africa. As the law stands, these people should be sent back to their home countries. North Africa desperately needs them for reconstruction efforts. Italy has now granted some refugees direct and limited residence permits instead of going through the required asylum procedure. These permits allow, allow the refugees to enter other European uh, Union member states. Part of the common EU asylum law stipulates that potential asylum seekers and economic refugees should pass through the asylum procedure in the country that is their first point of entry into the European Union. I therefore believe that Italy is displaying a lack of solidarity with its current actions. In the, in the event that Italy cannot cope with the flow of refugees, we could certainly explore joint solutions on a European level. But Italy is currently far from being unable to cope with this situation. I am sure that the United Kingdom sees the situation in, the, in very similar terms to Germany. Britain's close links to the Indo-Pakistani conflict has provided the country with a great deal of political experience in regional conflicts where the, F, where the effects reach far beyond regional borders. This wealth of international experience should be used to solve and counteract current acute crisis in a careful and considered manner. Alongside regional disputes and conflicts, we are all very well aware of the other key challenges we face today. One is the terrorism. Terrorism puts human lives in danger, costs a great deal of money, seeks to undermine our open and tolerant societies, and is increasingly becoming a strategic threat to the whole of Europe. In Germany, the attack in fr on, on the Frankfurt airport in early March this year was the first one to have come out of so-called homegrown terrorism. Also, this cannot be compared in scale to the attacks on the, on the London underground of July the 7th in 2005 or, or 14 days later in London. At Frankfurt airport on Wednesday the 3rd of March in this, this year, Arid Yu, um, 21 year old from Kosovo, shot two US soldiers and seriously injured two others. The soldiers were on their way home uh, after a mission abroad. Uh, they've been in um, Afghanistan. We now know that the terrorist had preliminary become radicalized over the internet in a very short period of time. We will never be able to fully protect ourselves against such attacks but we should intensive, intensify cooperation between political decision makers and security authorities to develop and implement effective preventive measures. I am well aware of this contradiction, which is often cited in this context between civil liberties on the one hand and effective security policy on the other hand. However, I believe that to the, co the contrary, there is no freedom without security. These are two sides of one medal. And I feel it should be a matter of course that we ensure our approaches are as reasonable as they are practicable. The, prolifer the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction is potentially the greatest threat to our security and to the global security architecture. I therefore must address this issue here. The threat of an arms race in the Middle East and the possibility of terrorist groups gaining access to weapons of mass destruction are both very real. The international community and, in my opinion, the European Union 
in particular, must work out ways of providing effective protection both in the medium and in the long term. In my role as a member of the Committee on, of, on Internal Affairs of the German Bundestag, I'm particularly concerned with the sad phenomenon of organized crime. Organized crime can reap huge profits in the European economic area on account of the high level of prosperity here. This internal threat to our security has also an important external dimension. Cross-border trade in drugs, arms, women and illegal immigrants forms a major part of the activities of criminal gangs and some of these gangs also have ties to terrorist movements. Organized crime often provides the financial basis for terrorist activities. Alongside donations from foundations and associations, organized crime is by far the largest source of funds for terrorist groups. The potential profits from organized crime are usually enormous. Terrorist experts from the University of Linz in Austria estimate that over one third of Al-Qaeda's total revenue comes from the drugs trade. Smuggling goods and luxury items also finances terrorist activities. Uniform European-wide regulations on monitoring account transactions could help to identify money transfers for terrorist campaigns and help stop these in the future. For this reason, I believe we must lend our full support to the European Commission's current initiative on such regulations. After all, national strategies can all too easily be circumvented, circumvented by challenging the money through more poorly regulated states. To effectively combat organized crime and financing for terrorism, we need a joint harmonized concept that is based on common standards. Here as well, it is very clear that we need to cooperate on an internal level, particularly in a European context. Cooperation between the responsible bodies in Europe has improved considerably in recent years, especially concerning the exchange of information. However, I believe that there is a great deal of room for improvement in the way that secret services share targeted information on specific threats. The challenges I have mentioned here are the cornerstones of the work of European member states in the area of security policy. The CDU and the CSU, the conservative parties in Germany, firmly believe that alongside inner European coordination, we must also play a spe pay a special attention to maintaining our transatlantic alliance with the United States. Without a close strategic partnership with our friends across the Atlantic, we cannot overcome the challenges we face. For me, there is no question that a self-confident Europe must have close and intensive ties to the, European, uh, to the United States. But this does not mean that we cannot take a critical stance on the po position of our partner in individual cases. I also believe that we will achieve little by encouraging competition between the military forces of the European Union and NATO. Also, Europe needs to have its, its own uh, capabilities. It only makes limited, li limited political and financial sense to have duplications and double structures on a military level. The challenges of the futures, such as dwindling resources and the shifting global balance of power, require a unit, united response. China's growing role in global power issues and in matters of access to resources means that we must maintain a cooperative relationship with Asia. However, we must also adopt a clear position and enforce European, British and German interests with regards to our dealing with Africa, for example. Even so, it is not always easy to coordinate joint action on a European level. I firmly believe that the only way we can effect and structure global change is with a united European stance, ideally in cooperation with the United States. The current debate on the mandate for the Libya mission shows that even with slightly different positions, a basis of mutual trust and understanding prevails. In my opinion, the Western world would always try to speak with one voice in, this organi in these organizations. Even if this fails in, in, in individual, individual cases, we must never give up our efforts in this regard. 
As my last and concluding point, I would like to briefly look at the, at the problems of cybersecurity and the challenges of the digital age. In the last few years, we have seen a mass, massive, massive, massive uh, increase in fraud, identity theft, and attacks on technical infrastructures. In Germany, crime committed it on or with the help of the Internet increased by 33% compared with the previous year. This has caused economic damage to Germany and its population that is estimated to be somewhere between 40 and 60 million euros. The increase in cybercrime has also made Internet users more insecure. Current representative, uh, re re representative uh, surveys shows that nowadays 75% of Internet users feel threatened by online crime. 60% reported that they were afraid that a virus or other malware could attack or paralyze their computer. Half of those surveyed voiced, voiced concerns that their, that their personal data could be spied out and misused. And, on, in, and one in four no longer feels secure about using online banking. I'm sure that these figures would be almost exactly the same in the United Kingdom. And there is a, there's an interna international dimension to this issue with what are known as cyber wars. The attacks on Estonia and on the European Space Agency, the ESA, and the debate on the computer virus Stuxnet are all good examples of this threat. There is currently a very intensive debate going on here in Germany about what legislative measures, measures uh, would provide the most effective response to these threats. I believe that our general aim should be to provide as far as possible the same level of protection in the digital world as we do in the analog world. With its global structure, the Internet is a prime example of the limited control individual countries have over the problems they face today. This is why I deliberately chose to put this topic at the end of my speech. I would like to use it to underline the issue that has linked all the topics I have addressed here today. I firmly believe that close social relationships such as those between the United Kingdom and Germany will promote bilateral understanding and thereby ultimately make it possible to pursue common interests and ideas on a European level. A powerful, close and trusting German-British partnership is crucial to overcome the key challenges of our time. I would therefore like to close with an appeal to you all. Let us help to make this a reality now and in the future. So I want to thank you very much for your attention and if you have any questions, I'm pleased to ask them. Thank you very much.